Hey there everyone, welcome back to Utility Sports. Super excited to discuss the Brooklyn Nets as we continue our trade guide series here on the channel. If you guys are enjoying the content, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more, make sure to check out some of the other videos, especially if this is your first time watching the channel. And let's jump into it here with our video preview. We're gonna first look at the Nets future draft picks. That's going to give us a good vibe about what this team has to work with on the trade market. It's really the best place to start when we're discussing any singular team. You have to know what they have to work with on the trade market. Are they working at a pick deficit? Do they have a pick surplus? And the Nets are actually a very weird situation. And that's going to make this video really fun. This is one of my favorite teams to talk about in the NBA because they're in a really unique spot. And I think that it's going to be a lot of fun to break down what I think this team should do, what I expect them to do this trade deadline. And we're going to discuss pretty much everything in between what I would do and also what I realistically think Sean Marks has on the table this year. We're going to look at their current situation and how that's going to guide some of their decision making this year. Their multi-year cap table, of course, plays a factor into it as well. Who's going to be an expiring contract? Who is potentially leaving in free agency? Who's under contract for years to come in Brooklyn? And how does that impact some of those decisions that they make? We're going to look at the kind of difference in the idea of selling or being patient and what I think the right move for them is. We'll look at that long-term plan afterward, and then we'll conclude the video with my final predictions for this 2024 NBA trade deadline. I'm super stoked, I hope you guys are as well. If you are, make sure to go give us follows on social media, that is Instagram and Twitter, links are in the description for those. And I would also love if you guys could go join the Discord, links in the description for that. We chat about NBA basketball all day long. We've got over 200 members in there, and I'm sure you would fit right in as well. So don't hesitate. Go join that right now and let's get moving on with that Nets trade guide. Let's start with that future draft picks component. Their situation, very unique. They actually owe their 2024 and 2026 first round picks completely unprotected to the Houston Rockets. And with how the Nets are playing right now, that seems a little scary. Not only that, but if you were to compound the issue, well, the Nets own or owe, excuse me, their pick swaps in 2025 and 2027 so not only do they owe unprotected first in 24 and 26 they owe unprotected pick swaps in 25 and 27 and with the rockets recent jump forward they've kind of blasted off recently uh, and have been playing much better basketball the nets kind of struggling to find their footing especially in their last 10 to 15 games or so here and because of that those picks are looking quite luxurious for the Houston Rockets to be working with. And if you're a Nets fan, you gotta be saying, uh-oh, are we in trouble again? You think back to that crazy Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett trade that set the Nets franchise back nearly a decade. Well, with that James Harden trade, I can't blame them for making it. They were a title contending team and had they stayed healthy, had Kyrie Irving not landed on Giannis Antetokounmpo's foot, had James Harden not pulled his hamstring, they had durable players going down with injuries, and they still almost won in 2021. Had they been healthy, they almost certainly win a championship, but that's a big if in a world where we don't live in what ifs. We live in reality, and it just unfortunately never broke right for the Brooklyn Nets, who are now on kind of phase two, phase three, phase four of that you know kind of transaction log there, where they came back from their big rebuild, they were able to bring in two big stars, they traded for a third star, and then they had to figure out, hey, how do we go about trading James Harden? They brought in Ben Simmons, and now they're at a weird spot. But with some of those other trades that they've made, they actually do have a pretty good collection of future picks from other teams as well. They have the 2027 Philadelphia 76ers first round pick that is top eight protected. They have first from the Phoenix Suns in 2027 and 2029 with a swap option in 2028 as well from the Suns. So you never know with Phoenix, look, they're playing better basketball as of late, but with Kevin Durant's age, Bradley Beal's no trade clause, who knows how long Devin Booker's gonna stay in El Valle, possibly for the rest of his career, but you never really know. The NBA is all about player movement. Those picks might become really, really good things to have if you're Brooklyn. And then you also have that 2029 Dallas Mavericks first round pick as well to work with, which is another great thing to have in your asset chest. And because of this, even though they owe their picks out the door, they actually possess more picks than they owe. So they're actually at a pick surplus right now, despite owing a ton of selections. They also have access to their own 2029 first to trade. They could theoretically trade their 2030 first if they didn't trade their 2029 first. And as this new draft approaches us, 
on draft night, their 2031 first becomes tradable as well. So really the Nets, you could be looking at a team that has six, seven tradable first round picks. And I think that's going to be a good way to kind of set up what I want to talk about a little bit later on in this video. But their current situation right now is pretty bleak. They're not a very good basketball team at the time I'm recording this. They're 17 and 27. They're 11th in the Eastern Conference. And listen, Mikhail Bridges was fantastic last season, especially the moment he got in Brooklyn, kind of using his fresh legs and a new situation. He burst onto the scene uh, in a big way. But I think this year has been a little bit more of that coming back to reality where, hey, it's really hard to be the number one option on any given night in the NBA as teams are prepping for you, planning for you. And I think Mikhail Bridges is seeing that this year. Cam Thomas has been really awesome as well for the Nets. I still like Cam Johnson quite a bit. I think this Nets team does have a lot of really good talent, but they just don't have truly elite talent. And there's a pretty big differentiation between those two things. You can have seven players in the top 150 or maybe eight players in the top 200. But if you don't have a player in the top 20 or 30, it's just pretty difficult to win on any given night. Because even if your offense is flowing and you're able to guard across multiple positions like the Nets are currently constructed to do, when the game slows down and it's about getting a bucket, they just don't necessarily have the guy that can match that from across other superstars. I think back to their game against the Minnesota Timberwolves the other night where Carl Anthony Towns, even though the Wolves offense completely fell apart, Anthony Edwards had one of his worst shooting nights of the season, Carl Anthony Towns still led the way for the Timberwolves. And I don't even think any of us would talk about him as a top 10-ish player in the world, obviously. And even then, Carl Anthony Towns was still a step above what the Nets had. And I think the possession where Anthony Edwards, who maybe got away with a foul, but was clamping up Mikhail Bridges, really stood out to me as a, hey, this team could just use one more bucket getter. Cam Thomas failed to score in clutch time as well in that game against Rudy Gobert out in space. And I just think that, listen, they've got a lot of talent. They just need one big time piece. And there's really two options to go about kind of where they're currently at in terms of team building and what do they want to do long term. Those options, well, a lot of people are going to point to rebuild and I totally understand that perspective, but there's also the patient approach and I chose this graphic here intentionally. The rebuild route always looks fun, beautiful, sexy. It's the, you know, kind of cliche word you want to hear about a team that's struggling. You say, oh, let's enter a rebuild. Let's get all these draft picks. Let's take a long term approach at building this thing up, although being patient with your current roster can work as well. So I want to touch on these two things. When you rebuild, yes, the Nets are in a spot where if they traded a ton of talent, they could probably be working with a massive surplus of draft picks. Part of the issue with that though, a lot of the teams that have been successful through rebuilds, I think about the Oklahoma City Thunder specifically, in a big trade, first of all, you're going to get a franchise-defining player. I think about the Thunder and Pacers in that example, where the Thunder were able to get Shea Gilgis-Alexander in the Paul George trade, and the Pacers were able to get Tyrese Halliburton in the Demonis Sabonis trade. If you're going to go rebuild, you want to get a guy on a rookie contract that you believe can become a face of your franchise, and that's harder to do than it seems. It's almost impossible, honestly. That's what makes Shea and, and Tyrese such unique examples across NBA history, and then on top of that, if you're one of those rebuilding teams and you're going to be young and you're going to bottom out, you want to control your own draft picks. We've already talked about the Nets pick situation. They don't have access to their own picks. So them bottoming out, getting down to the bottom and completely tanking only helps the Houston Rockets. It doesn't have any short-term benefit to the Brooklyn Nets right now. So the patient approach might actually just be the better approach for them for a few different reasons. One, their roster is really talented. They have a lot of players who I think right now, if you ask me, can Mikhail Bridges be a good number two option? Yes. Can Cam Thomas be a number three scoring option? Yes. Can Cam Johnson fill a good role as a fourth or fifth starter? 100%. Can Nick Claxton be an anchor of a defense and be a really high quality starter? Yes. 100%. Is Spencer Dinwiddie a quality sixth man type player? Yes. The Nets, I think, are maybe a player or a player and a half short in their rotation right now. And the issue is with a lot of other teams, that player that they're short is usually their seventh or eighth man. And you can see those teams are like, oh no, we just don't have the depth that we want. And there's ways to go about getting those guys. When the player that you're lacking in Brooklyn's case is the top player on the roster, you don't have that number one guy, that 1A player. It's the hardest thing to get in all of basketball. It's super hard to acquire someone like that. But the Nets, again, are working with a surplus of draft picks. And I think being patient, maybe, just maybe, a star asks out and Sean Marks is able to pull the trigger on a player. 
and it completely changes the way we look at this Nets roster. And I would really push them toward being patient, especially this trade deadline. We're gonna look at some of their options here and it's gonna be centered around their cap table. They have three expiring contracts that are really notable. And then they have a bunch of good players under contract going forward. Their expiring contracts, two players that I think are very trade eligible. Spencer Dinwiddie making a little bit over $20 million this season and Royce O'Neal making a little bit under $10 million this year. Those two players collectively give you a good baseline of salary to work with. If you're the Brooklyn Nets, you could combine them together in a deal and get around $30 million in tradable salary, which is really useful. You could trade them separately. And with Dinwiddie, you could trade for a player and making anywhere from about 17 and a half million up to about $24 million, which is again, very useful. And then Royce O'Neal, you could trade for a player making $7 million up to someone making maybe 11 or $12 million. And I think the Nets have a few different pathways of working with those expiring contracts. Could they trade them? and even eat some salary for a team to help them out a little bit. Maybe you get a draft pick in for doing so. I'm not sure if that's the way they're going to operate, but you never know. D'Angelo Russell could be a player. We see that the Nets, hey, maybe they go out there and, and take him and they dump Spencer Dinwiddie to a team that's looking to get off of some money. There's been a lot of reports about DeJounte Murray to the Lakers, and perhaps the Hawks don't want to swallow an extra year of, De, uh, of D'Angelo Russell's money, so Spencer Dinwiddie becomes the natural fit there. That's something that I could see, and hey, a reunion for D'Angelo Russell back in Brooklyn where he played the best basketball of his career. I don't think that's a terrible solution for D'Lo himself. Now, if I'm the Nets, that's not the move I'm trying to make, but I could see it as a realistic possibility, especially if a team incentivizes the Nets with maybe a second round pick or two. Nick Claxton's really the big deal on this entire uh, graphic here. A little bit over nine and a half million dollars. He is a super valuable player. I just don't think people understand how good of a basketball player this guy is on honestly both ends of the floor. He's a super efficient offensive player. He plays within his role. He's a pretty solid screen setter. He dives hard to the rim and he's got a pretty good left hand when it comes to touch around the basket with uh, little uh, jump hooks and uh, just his touch around the rim in general, some push shots that he's been kind of testing out more and more over the last couple of years. I think Claxton's a really good player and in the open market, he's gonna make a ton of money. The Nets do not have restricted free agency status on him because he was a second round pick. So that's a unique, situation there because he was obviously drafting the second round before the new second round exception rule. So completely different rules that he's playing by. He's an unrestricted free agent. Brooklyn has to be cautious of that. So maybe we see Nick Claxton actually get dealt due to that. Under contract though, they have Cam Johnson signed through 2027, Mikhail Bridges through 2026, Ben Simmons through 2025, that becomes an expiring contract next year. Cam Thomas through 2025, but they have re restricted free agency status on him because he was a first round pick. So because of that, you probably have team control through 2029 or 2030 on Cam Thomas, which is really good to work with. And then you also have Dorian Finney-Smith under contract for sure through 2025. And then he has a player option that summer for 2026. And I think that there's a good chance he would even opt into that, just kind of looking at the money amount he's owed. Now it's possible he doesn't because I'm sure a lot of other teams would consider giving him a mid-level exception again, which is nearly the value of contract he's playing on right now. So maybe Finney Smith would opt out and look for something a little bit longer term, but nonetheless, you have control of these guys going into next season at least. So I think with that rationale, the Nets don't have to panic on trading a lot of these players. I don't see a lot of them losing value. And honestly, Ben Simmons, right now there's no value there. You'd probably have to salary dump him. We'll talk about that later on um, in this video, but that's kind of how their cap table lies. And it's a good kind of indication to what we could potentially see and how that impacts their long-term plan. My expectations for them here a little bit, sell off some expiring contracts. I'm looking at Spencer Dinwiddie, as a key example, I'm looking at Royce O'Neal as another example, two guys that I think the Nets probably look at themselves internally and say, if we trade Spencer Dinwiddie, it's not going to hurt us. In fact, they're probably really interested in doing so. There's been a ton of reports and rumors about him uh, maybe not even being happy in Brooklyn and then the Nets probably wanting to actually find a way to ship him out. And then when it comes to Royce O'Neal, he's a player that a lot of contenders would like to have. I've heard reports about Phoenix, I internally know that the Dallas Mavericks would have interest in Royce O'Neal if he does become actually available. And for O'Neal, you're probably able to net a couple of second round picks. So does that move the needle a ton for Brooklyn? Maybe not, but it gives you again, a little bit more enhanced trade flexibility for an expiring contract that maybe you are okay with moving off of. I could see them maybe trading Dorian Finney-Smith, 
although I really don't think there's a rush there. Um, there's been rumors out that they're seeking at least two first round picks for Dorian Finney-Smith. To be honest with you, I do not see a team giving up two first round picks unless there were like super heavy protections and it was already a team working with a pick surplus where they could afford to trade two, sec two first round picks without really hurting their trade flexibility a ton. But other than that, I just don't really see Dorian Finney-Smith getting traded. Maybe if a team makes a quality first round pick available, um, looking at say the Dallas Mavericks in a reunion, um, looking at the Golden State Warriors, if something opens up where Dorian Finney-Smith becomes available to them, I could see that as a realistic option with them trying to get a little bit better at their point of attack defensively, uh, and also just adding a little bit more length and size and just catch and shoot three point shooting into their lineup. I think the big thing for them is they're going to work super hard to retain Nick Claxton. He's really come into his own there in Brooklyn. I think he would be open to staying in Brooklyn long term, given his role and obviously the way that they've overseen his development. And then I think the real important note on this entire graphic, they're going to wait on a Mikhail Bridges trade. I just do not see them moving him this year. I know Indiana Pacers fans are fascinated in him. I know New York Knicks fans would love to see the Villanova boys all come play together again there in New York. I just can't see them doing that this year with Mikhail Bridges, especially given their draft pick status. I think that they're kind of in a spot where, again, bottoming out doesn't really do them much good. So I don't see them operating that way. I think that they're gonna be smart sellers. I think they're gonna sell off some of the guys that aren't key pieces of their future going forward, but it's not like it's a fire sale. They're not going to walk in here and just trade everybody away because it sounds like the cool, fun, glamorous thing to do. I think they're gonna be a lot smarter than that. I think they're gonna be a little bit more patient than that as well. So when it comes to my actual predictions on this team, first of all, there's gonna be no Mikhail Bridges trade this deadline. I don't think that uh, there's just gonna be anything that really opens up for him unless a team absolutely blows them away. I'm talking like three or four first round picks, plus a good young player, someone who, like I've talked about with Halliburton or Gilgis Alexander, it's gonna to have to be a player that Brooklyn views as a build around piece. And I just don't know if I see a team giving someone like that up this trade deadline for Bridges. Maybe the Pacers, you could look at like Benedict Matherin plus Jairus Walker. And that's a pretty steep price to pay from Indiana's perspective. They have some draft picks to attach to that as well. So maybe that's something that could get a conversation started with Brooklyn. But again, they have the team control on Bridges. He's the exact type of player every single team in the league would love to have. He's the exact right archetype, really good playing off the catch. We know what he can be defensively when he's really locked in on that end of the floor. I do think Royce O'Neal for sure gets moved. I'm not sure if Spencer Dinwiddie's going to have as much of a market, but Royce O'Neal definitely will, especially with that uh, the size of his contract, a little bit under $10 million. Teams are going to be interested in adding that into their room. I think the Minnesota Timberwolves could be another example of a team interested in Royce O'Neal. Of course, he spent some time with Mike Conley and Rudy Gobert in Utah. So a reunion with those guys does make some sense in Minnesota as well. And like I said earlier, I think Nick Claxton really is the big name to watch because if they're kind of fearful that they're not going to be able to keep him, let's say Nick Claxton feels like, hey, internally, he could be really a defensive player of the year candidate, which I don't think is crazy to say. If he feels that way, he's going to look for a really good payday this offseason. And he's not going to take a four-year $80 million contract. At least I wouldn't advise him to if I was his agent with how he's played recently uh, and kind of the value of a defensive-minded anchor like Nick Claxton in today's NBA, someone who can really shut off the paint at times and, and be a nice weak side shot blocker. Like, he's super valuable. And I think in the in off, in the offseason, I remember when DeAndre Ayton signed a max contract offer sheet with the Indiana Pacers years ago and people were behind that and Nick Claxton's a significantly better player than DeAndre Ayton he's much better in today's modern NBA he's a lot more understanding of what his role should be he plays the game in a much better fashion for winning actual basketball games and I think because of that Nick Claxton is going to get a huge payday somewhere and I think if the Nets internally feel like since we don't have restricted free agency rights on him if he goes and gets a huge contract somewhere, we might just lose him for nothing. And he's extremely valuable. He is on a very tradable contract right now. 
if something were to materialize with the Golden State Warriors, uh, with other contenders around the league, with maybe the Milwaukee Bucks, which I think is a really underrated uh, situation right now, although they don't have a ton to trade, it would have to be some three-team composition, maybe the Houston Rockets, who have, again, some of the Nets' future, Maybe the two sides could work something out where Claxton goes to Houston. Although, yes, I know they have Elper and Shangun. Imagine if you had an all-defense caliber big man coming off the bench in Houston. It's not the not the biggest need, but it would really help their team, no question about it, because Claxton's just way better than Jock Landale. And honestly, Claxton's the type of big that would work really well with Ime Udoka. I, I just think Claxton's like the player that a bunch of teams, if they viewed him as like a guy that was attainable and they could get, they probably feel like he's a player who could swing championship odds because of what he's going to provide to your defense, what he's going to give to you on offense in a limited role. And I think with that, uh, he's going to be a really valuable player this year uh, as teams kind of look to the uh, light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Thank you all so much for watching. It was a lot of fun to dive into the Brooklyn Nets. I know, listen, their trade guide this year is a little crazy. It's a little hectic, helter skelter. There's a lot of crazy things going on, but I hope you guys did enjoy. If you did, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel for more content, and we'll catch you in the very next Utility Sports video.